So welcome back. Uh, now we are happy to have uh, John Source, who will be telling us about causality and enhancement in holography and the connected wedge current. Yes, uh, thank you so much for being here. So um, I'm going to be telling you today about a direction of progress that I've been contributing to over the past few years, along with people like Alex May, Jeff Pennington, and Kenny Yoshida. And the general story here is that we're drawing connections between bulk causal structure and boundary entanglement structure in ADS CFD. And I'm going to tell you today about some very precise connections we can make between causality and entanglement that fall under the label of these things we call connected wedge theory. Now, um, many of you, I think, have seen either me or Alex give a talk on this kind of material before, and also it's quite a short talk at 35 minutes. So with that in mind, I'm not going to talk very much about the technical details of this work. I'm going to focus on trying to get the new results as quickly as possible, sort of summarize the results and tell you what I think about them without telling you how we prove them. But if you'd like to know more details, feel free to ask me afterwards. So if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it should be a big idea of a way we might be able to reason about the logic. And the starting point is to observe that in ADS-CFD, bulk causal structure can be richer than boundary causal structure. I'll give a precise realization of what I mean by that in a few slides, and that should make this statement sort of technically clear. But the way you should think about this is just that in holography, you know, the boundary theory lives on a single fixed space-time, whereas in the bulk theory, space-time is emergent and therefore space-dependent. And what that means is that while you only have one causal structure in your boundary theory, what you mean by bulk causal structure can change depending on what state you're in, okay? And this can lead to interesting things happening where I tweak a state that causes some enrichment of the bulk causal structure without changing anything causally. Now, the second point to think about is that when we have some very rich causal structure, that's something we can use for information processing. Again, I'll be more precise about this in a moment, but what I mean is really something very simple. If I have some qubits distributed throughout space-time and there are various you know, causal ways that those qubits can be brought together, then that's something I could use to act on the qubits and bring them together and process. I'll make this more precise in a moment. But the big idea is that whenever we have a situation like this where bulk causal structure is richer than boundary causal structure, and that rich structure can be used for information processing, we can try to use information theoretic reasoning to constrain the entanglement structure of the boundary state as a consequence of these two principles. So everything I'm going to be telling you about today are precise realizations of this way of thinking. So I'll start by telling you how to think about information processing in ADS3. I am only going to talk about three dimensions today for technical reasons that probably won't be apparent in this talk, but don't trust anything I say in higher dimensions. I'm going to summarize all of the things that we know how to prove, and I'll tell you what I think about them and how we should interpret them. Then I'll very telegraphically sort of indicate to you the kinds of techniques we use to prove these theorems. And then I'll tell you something I think is really interesting, which is that we can feed back the work we've done in ADS-CFD into quantum information theory to conjecture new theorems in quantum information theory that we can prove without any reference to gravity. And I'll tell you what those theorems are and how they are inspired by ADS CFT and roughly speaking how we. So let's start by talking about causality in ADS CFT. The fundamental theorem in this field is what's called the Gao Wald theorem, which says that if you satisfy the bulk average null energy condition, then bulk light rays are slower than boundary light rays. To formally state this theorem, it's useful to use this notation where J plus of some set denotes the causal future of that set. Analogously, J minus would be the causal past of this set. And the gao wald theorem says that if P and Q are boundary points and the bulk future of P contains Q, then the boundary future of P must also contain Q. Now, this is completely essential for the consistency of ADS-CFT because if you don't have this happening, then you don't have CFT operators at space-like separation commuting with one another. Because you could have things that look space-like separated in the boundary theory, but that are really causally separated in the bulk and you would run into all sorts of contradictions. Right? Incidentally, there's a generalization of that consistency condition dealing with entanglement wedge reconstruction discussed by some authors. But the lesson that you should take away from the gao wald theorem is that one-to-one -one bulk causality is weaker than one-to-one -one boundary causality. And when I say one-to-one, -one, I mean that I'm talking about a single bulk, a single boundary point that is sending a signal to another single boundary point. So that's one-to-one. -one, right? So while one-to-one -one causality is always weaker in the bulk, something very interesting can happen. 
which is that two to two bulk causality can be stronger than two to two boundary causality. It might not be clear why this could be true or even what I mean by it. So I'll give you all the classic example, which is that if we consider the ADS3 vacuum and I consider a set of four boundary points, two on an early time slice and two on a late time slice. And I pick these in a special way where I take C1 and C2 to be antipodal to each other and take R1 and R2 to be antipodal to each other. And then I separate these two slices by time pi and rotate them by 90 degrees relative to one another. Then it's always going to be possible in the bulk theory for causal signals to leave C1 and C2 meet at some bulk location. And then for new causal signals to leave that bulk location and separate out to R1 and R2. However, no such thing is possible in the boundary space time. I've drawn here sort of the unwrapped boundary cylinder. So you should identify the left and right sides. And I've drawn all of these points, C and R. And I've drawn all the light cones. And if you stare at this for a second, you should be able to convince yourself that there is no sort of two to two region where signals from C1 and C2 can interact and pass with R1 and R2. So this is what I mean when I say two to two bulk causality can be stronger or richer than two to two boundary. There's a notation that'll be very useful for talking about this kind of phenomenon. So if you look at this sort of expression here, I've written J bulk of C1 comma C2 to R1 comma R2. And what I mean by that is the set of all bulk points that are simultaneously in the future of C1 and C2 and the past of R1 and R2. So I might call this like a two to two causal region for these four points, all right? Now, what I'm saying is happening in this scenario is that this two to two causal region is non-empty in the bulk, but the analogous boundary region is empty. So whenever something like this happens, whenever bulk two to two causality is richer than boundary two to two causality, we can ask if this imposes consistency constraints on ADS-C activity, right? Now, many authors have thought about how this constrains CFT correlators, um, you know, arguing about how bulk causal structure tells you something about CFT correlators that you can try to talk about purely from the perspective of the boundary theory. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. What I am going to be telling you is that when you have this kind of bulk causal enrichment, you can use it to constrain CFT entanglement. Now, in order to understand why this should be true, I'm going to need to tell you how to think about information processing in space. There's a very useful framework for thinking about information processing in space time, which is something called a quantum task. Now, what is a quantum task? It's a scenario where I imagine that I have n agents named A1 through A. And each agent is given a share of some state psi at a space-time location C1 through C. So if you look at the bottom half of this picture here, I've sketched that. I've drawn some space-time points, C1 through C4. And I've drawn some state psi that has shares A1 through A4 and possibly is entangled with some reference. And I'm handing those shares to agents who start at the space-time point C1. Now, what these agents are asked to do is apply some general quantum channel, E, to sort of all of the shares that they collectively hold. So they're asked to apply some quantum channel on all of the A systems, and it's going to split out some state on some possibly different B systems. And then they're going to be asked to return those B systems to some other set of space-time points, little r. And they want to make sure that they preserve the entanglement with the reference system when they do this. So this is what I'm sort of sketching in this cartoon on the left. Some input systems, there's some quantum channel that gets acted on those systems, and the outputs are brought to various stage. Now, quite clearly, whether or not a family of agents is able to do a task is going to depend on quite a few factors. Most importantly, it's going to depend on the causal connections between all of these points. For example, if all of the output points are in the past of all of the input points, then they can't do anything but a completely trivial task. Right? There are also constraints depending on the computing resources available to the agents. Now, when I say computing resources, I don't mean like computational power or complexity, although you certainly could consider that kind of constraint on tasks. What I really mean is things like entanglement resources. You know, if all of the agents start off with a bunch of EPR pairs spread out among them, then that's something they can used to do things like quantum teleportation, which might enhance their ability to do the task. Now, quite generally speaking, in the quantum information theory world, there are two ways to think about doing quantum tasks. Now, I wanna stress that these are two broad ways of thinking about doing quantum tasks. I don't want you to think that these are the only two ways to do any particular quantum task. If I pick any task, there might be many ways of doing it, but they generally fall into two categories. One, the most simple one, is causal interaction. 
So I've sketched a simple two to two task here where I imagine some state is handed to two agents, A1 and A2. And if those agents are allowed to meet up in some causal region, well, then they can just bring their systems together and implement the channel locally using their quantum computer, which of course they have, and then separate and go their separate ways and bring the outputs of the task to the places they're supposed to be. But it turns out, there's this theorem due to Beggy Koenig and then generalized by Kurt Scholef, that there is a general way to do any such task non-locally. And what I mean non-locally is that say agent A1 acts on their system right here, A2 acts on their system right here, they send some information to the output points without ever interacting. They do some post-processing there, and they're able actually to do a completely generic channel with only this kind of a restricted causal structure, provided that they share some entanglement resource that they're allowed to consume as part of their protocol. Right? So as a general principle, it's a theorem that any local interaction can be simulated by consuming entanglement. And the way you should think about this in the context of ads is just that when we have a causal discrepancy, it makes sense that entanglement might come into the picture. So how does all of this relate to ads -CFD? I'm going to ask you to imagine a little thought experiment where I have two agents, A1 and A2, and they live in a two-dimensional cylindrical space-time. And along with them on this space-time, there is also the state of some holographic CFD. Now suppose that these two agents are given some tasks. So say they live on this unwrapped cylinder here and they're given some input state at C1 and C2 and they're asked to return it to R1 and R2. Well, if the holographic state that lives on the same space time on them has this non-empty two to two scattering region, then the agents could use the holographic state as a resource for completing their task. What would their protocol be? Well, they would just couple to the holographic CFT in order to put their input systems into the holographic CFT, they would let the systems, you know, they would engineer things so that the systems interact in the bulk and the channel happens locally in the bulk and then they separate. And this would be some way for them to use the bulk to complete whatever task they've been given. Now, while that procedure is going to look causally local in the bulk theory, it's going to look extremely non-local in the boundary. Right, it's going to involve some coupling that inserts systems into the holographic bulk here, and then some time evolution that causes those things to spread and then recondense. It's going to be something very non-trivial. But as I sort of emphasized on the previous slide, quite generally speaking, causally non-local computations make use of some entanglement resource. And in this scenario, the only entanglement resource available to A1 and A2 is the CFT state. So it would make sense that when such a thing is possible, we can make some constraints on the entanglement structure of the CFT by knowing that it has to be usable as a resource for a particular task. Now, all of this you should really just take as motivation for why we should be able to prove some connection between causality and entanglement. You can make all of this much more precise and make strong arguments for certain cases why certain kinds of entanglement would be necessary in some contexts. But for the purposes of this talk, the only thing I want you to know is that there should be some connection, or there plausibly could be some connection, between causality and entanglement as a consequence of this result. So now what I'd like to do is tell you everything that we know how to prove and give some vague indications of how we do it. So I'm going to state the theorem that we call the two-to-two -two connected wedge theorem. A preliminary version of this was proven by Alex May, Jeff Pennington, and myself back in 2019, although there were some errors in that proof, most notably, we didn't deal with space times with singularity, and that's addressed in the recent paper. But the idea is the following. Suppose that psi is a 2D CFD state that's dual in you know, the semi-classical regime of the holographic theory to some asymptotically ADS3, ADS hyperbolic space. If you don't know what ADS hyperbolic means, don't worry, that's some global causal condition that basically says that field theory is well posed in space. Now we're furthermore going to assume that this state satisfies two of the standard conjectures in sort of semi-classical limit holography, which are the quantum maximum formula and the quantum focusing conjecture. Roughly speaking, the quantum maximum formula says that any quantum extremal surface, well, any true quantum extremal surface is going to be globally minimal on some slice. And the quantum focusing conjecture tells me about how certain null deformations of surfaces are entropy decreasing. Um, so, incidentally, if you're uncomfortable with these conjectures, you could restrict yourself to the classical case and talk about classical maximum and classical focusing, which are founded in classical states using this null curvature. 
But the general flavor, which I'll tell you more about later, is that we use quantum maxima to tell us, you know, we want to prove something about quantum extremal surfaces. And the general idea is that we use quantum maxima uh, to say that the quantum extremal surfaces we care about have some global minimality properties. We use quantum focusing to do various deformations of those surfaces that satisfy nice properties. And then we use causal structure of the space time to derive some you know, proof by contradiction of the theorem I'm about to tell you, which is the following. If we are in a scenario where the bulk space time has a non trivial two to two scattering region, uh, this little circle here means that the scattering region has non zero measure because I don't want to be missing the general case. But if I'm in this case where the two to two scattering region in the bulk is non zero, but the two to two scattering region in the boundary is empty, then I can say something about the entanglement structure of two particular boundary regions that I call V1 and and these regions are defined as the future on the boundary of a single input and the past of both outputs. So those look like these little diamonds near that have their bottom tips as V1 and V2 on this diagram. So whenever I'm in a scenario where the bulk scattering region is non-empty and the boundary scattering region is empty, then I can use maximin and the focusing argument to prove to you that the entanglement wedge of these two regions is empty. And what that means is that if I draw you know, the co-dimension zero entanglement wedge interpolating in the bulk between these two regions, it's going to be something continuous that connects them rather than to disconnect them. Um, incidentally, if you use the quantum extremal surface formula, this implies some statement about the mutual information between these regions scaling extensively in one over G movement, which is exactly the kind of thing that we might have expected to be able to prove using the information theoretic reasoning. I so how should you think about this? This is a theorem that tells us that a certain kind of causal structure must be supported by a certain kind of boundary entanglement, right? It's just not going to be possible for us to have this causal structure unless we have some particular kind of entanglement that causes that causal structure to emerge. So you can think of this as you, if you like, as causality emerging from boundary. Now, there's a generalization of this theorem that uses entanglement wedge reconstruction. This was observed by Alex in the solo author paper which basically just says, well, think about the quantum information reasoning I gave you. I talked about agents who are able to couple to a CFT and use it to compete some quantum mass. Well, we know, because we know about entanglement wedge reconstruction, that an observer who couples to a holographic CFT is able to influence not just the causal future of the region that they couple to, but in fact, the causal future of the entire entanglement wedge of the region that they couple. If you think about that enough, it leads you to conjecture a theorem very similar to the one I just described, except now I make it a little more symmetric by defining, in, in addition to the V regions I defined before, also some symmetric W regions that live up near the output point. And the statement I can make is that whenever I have two to two causal scattering between the entanglement wedges of V1, V2, W1, W2, but no analogous causal scattering in the boundary, then I can draw the same conclusion about the connected entanglement wedge and via the quantum extremal surface formula, some consequence for mutual information. Um, incidentally, this theorem is strictly stronger than the one that I described on the previous slide because of causal wedge inclusion. You know, there are situations where this uh, condition will be satisfied where the one on the previous slide will not be satisfied. Right. I won't talk about entanglement wedges for the rest of the talk. This is just, you know, for those of you who like to think about entanglement wedge reconstruction. Okay, so now I'll tell you about what we proved in the recent paper. What we did was we took this scenario and we generalized it, instead of having a two to two situation, we generalized it to an end to end situation. And when you do this, some actually very surprising things happen. It doesn't just scale up immediately the way you might think it would. So we're going to consider n input points and n output points, C1 through Cn and R1. And I'm going to define these V and W regions, just like I did before. So that's going to be the future of one input and the past of all inputs, or the future of all inputs and the past of all inputs. That's sketched here for an example with n equals three. So you have some V regions near the bottom and some W at the top. And I'm going to put some causal constraints on the boundary space time that are analogous to this constraint we had in the two to two case, which was that I didn't want two to two scattering to be allowable in the and the thing I'm going to impose is that there is no two to all scattering or all to two scattering in the boundary. I'm going to assume that all of those kinds of causal regions. Now, when I have this scenario, 
you might want to say, let me look for a bulk causal structure that I can use to prove some boundary of tangent property. Now, the most naive thing you might try to prove, which is true, it's just that we're going to be able to prove something stronger, which is why I call it naive, is the following. You might say, suppose that in the bulk there is some non-trivial region where all n inputs can signal and then still be able to signal all n. That might be the kind of thing that would let me apply quantum information reasoning, region, reasoning because I would say I have perhaps n agents on the boundary, they all couple, they meet up in the bulk, they do some interaction and they separate. So you might expect that whenever I have a, a causal connection of this kind, I might be able to prove an analogous entanglement uh, condition. And the thing I might expect to be able to prove is that the entanglement wedge of these joint n regions is connected meaning that topologically it looks like this figure on the left rather than either of the two figures on the right. If you want to think about this in terms of mutual information, this implies that for any bipartition of my input regions, you know, if I take my n b regions and I split them into two sets, for any such splitting, there's going to be order one over g newton mutual information. All right, that's a consequence just of having a full region. Now, this is true. And you can prove it using exactly the kinds of arguments I sort of very telegraphically indicated for the two to case. But what's interesting is that you can prove something more general. If you use exactly the kinds of focusing techniques I indicated before, you can get the same exact result, the statement that the uh, B, 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 B entanglement wedge is connected, using a weaker causal assumption than the existence of an all call causal connection. In particular, all you need is some sufficient set of two to all causal connections meaning regions where, say, a pair of agents could meet up and interact. Right? Now, I'm going to describe to you what that sufficient set is. It's helpful for us to gather you know, all of the information we have about these two to all connections in a graph, which I'll call gamma two to all. The vertices of this graph are the numbers one through n, and I'm going to draw an edge between two vertices if there is a corresponding two to all causal connection for the related. So for example, this graph on the left, in the case n equals three, indicates that agents one and two can meet, and agents two and three can meet, but agents one and three can never. Now, the theorem that we're able to prove is that whenever this graph is connected, the entanglement wedge is connected. Now, the scenario I described on the previous slide where we had this kind of all-to-all -all connection is certainly sufficient, because if I have an all-to-all -all connection, then every pair of agents is going to meet up, so this graph is not just going to be connected, but complete. But it turns out that we're able to prove something using a much, uh, a much weaker condition. Now, if you're a gravity theorist, then you might say, something that's happening here that's kind of interesting is that we're seeing a very detailed causal structure arise from boundary entanglement. This condition of having this connected two to all graph is something fairly you know, interesting and intricate from the perspective of the bulk, and yet it corresponds to some fairly simple feature of boundary entanglement. Now, if you're an information theorist, you might say, what's going on? You know, in the case where I had, say, an end-to-end -end causal connection, I could imagine that, you know, one way of reasoning about this is that some quantum task can happen in the bulk, and that puts some entanglement constraints. But it's not at all clear why this kind of causal structure, this weaker thing, would be uh, sufficient for making an argument like that. So what I am going to do later on in this talk is I'm going to tell you why this structure actually is natural from the perspective of quantum. But before that, I'd like to give you a little flash of the kinds of techniques that we use to prove this. And I'm going to be you know, very quick about this. So the general idea of the proof technique in gravity, again, we're trying to prove using a particular causal condition that the entanglement wedge of certain regions is connected. So we try to do a proof by contradiction, and we assume towards contradiction that the entanglement wedge is not massive. So for example, it might look like one of these two. Now, quantum maxima tells us that if either of these is the true entanglement wedge, then the quantum extremal surface bounding these entanglement wedges needs to have globally minimal entropy on some slice. Right? We're going to try to derive a contradiction using that principle and the assumption that this surface is distant. The way it works is we construct what we call the future light sheet of the entanglement wedge, which roughly means I sort of shoot a bunch of null rays off of the entanglement wedge and I wait for them to fly. So that might look like this in a 3D view, or from a top-down view, it might look like this, where you should imagine that the red, uh, the red surface is some null surface that is sort of out of the board in the future of the slice that I've drawn. 
So what we do is we say, well, we have all of these input regions that have some entanglement legs. We use that to construct this red light sheet here. But we also have all of these output regions. And we can look at the past light sheets of their entanglement ledges. And we can ask where those light sheets intersect this red surface that I drew. And what ends up happening is you can make some null geometry argument that tells you that whenever I have this kind of connected causal structure, it guarantees that the intersection of these past light sheets with my red surface is going to look roughly like these purple curves here. Now, there are many very complicated things that can happen that we treat in the paper. This is just a cartoon. But the important thing is that all of these curves don't intersect one another. They sort of form some separated, disconnected uh, curves on this red surface. And in particular, the region in between all of these purple curves is simultaneously in the past of all of those output ledges. Now, we appeal to the quantum focusing conjecture, which tells us we started with some quantum extremal surface. We went along a light sheet, and we considered a different cross-section of that light sheet. And that tells us that the generalized entropy of the purple curves is less than or equal to the generalized entropy of the green curves. But the purple curves arise as light sheets of some other set of entanglement ledges, these things far in the future. And deforming along those light sheets by the quantum focusing conjecture is also an entropy decrease in operation. So we can take those curves, deform them into the past along the light sheets that they live on. That's an entropy decreasing operation. We do it until we reach the maximum slice. You're very careful about making sure this focus works and doesn't run into singularities. And then you end up with a contradiction by having constructed a different surface on the maximum slice that has generalized entropy less than or equal to the original one because I constructed it by a sequence of deformations, all of which were entropy decreasing. That's the rough idea. If you have questions, I know this is very telegraphic. Feel free to ask me afterwards. One thing I'd like you to know is that there is actually a way of arguing for this using quantum information reasoning without the field to graphic, which is as follows. You construct a family of quantum tasks that has some nice properties. The input state is made up of m qubits. The channel that you want to implement can be implemented using a quantum circuit of order one depth. By order one, I mean that as I add more qubits, I don't have to make the circuit deeper. So it's in some sense a low complexity task. And furthermore, I can prove with this particular task that if it can be done non-locally with a resource state V1, V2, then I know that the mutual information in that resource state has to scale at least as the size of the input system in the limit as I make that input system very large. Okay, so this is just some construction you can do using various kinds of monogamy and entanglement principles. How do you use this to argue for the connected wedge theorem in the 2-2 case? Well, what you say is, if I take m to be anything subleading in 1 over g nu m, then I think that actually this task is something that could plausibly be done in the bulk. The total number of qubits I'm trying to act on is subleading in 1 over g nu m, so I shouldn't worry about back reaction. Furthermore, the task is very low complexity, so I don't have to worry about the bulk agents meeting up and running out of time in the region that they meet up before they're able to pass. So I think that anything with these first two properties can be done in the bulk theory. Now, if I assume that the only useful CFT resource is the CFT state restricted to those regions V1 and V2 that we talked about before, then point three here tells us that that resource state has to have mutual information that is at least as big as M, which is anything subleading in 1 over G Newton, which tells us that the mutual information has to be at least as big as 1 over G Newton. Now, there's a very non-trivial assumption that happens here when we assume that the only useful CFT resource is the CFT state restricted to these subregions, because that CF state is, CFT state is really purified into something, and that entanglement could be useful. But this is a way of reasoning that might tell you that you should expect this kind of theorem to be true. But then we might ask, you know, this was the reasoning for the 2 to 2 case. How might we generalize this kind of reasoning to the end-to-end -end case? And in so doing, could we prove new theorems about quantum information? And in fact, that's exactly what happens. I'd like to make a historical comment about the way that this work came about, which I think will sort of motivate the feedback loop into QI. The two-to-two -two theorem that I told you actually started with quantum information. It started with an observation Alex made about this tone Michel et al. task, having certain nice properties that could play well with ads -CFT which led us to conjecture this two to two theorem, and then we were able to prove it with Maxi. However, in this end to end case, there's actually no existing QI result to guide us. 
There's no analogy of the tone Michel et al. task that has to do with n input systems and n output systems. Nothing that could teach us what we might expect to be true in the end to end case. But because we had already learned how to prove the two to two theorem using focusing techniques, and we just knew how to generalize those techniques, we were able to prove this kind of surprising theorem that this connected set of two to all causal connections is sufficient to prove a connected entanglement wedge, which is sufficient to prove some um, mutual information. So a question we should, we should ask, as I indicated before, is what's going on here from the perspective of information theory, where this connected causal structure doesn't seem very natural? Are there new theorems that we could prove in QI that would make the QI version of the argument for the end to end theorem feel very natural? And the answer is yes. And there are two new theorems that we proved that I'll tell you about in my last slide, which are as follows. I'll remind you that in the two to two case, the way the reasoning worked was that we said, Task could be done using a two to two bulk causal structure. They must be possible in a boundary causal structure. So we need to have some entanglement resource to make up for that. So we might ask why this two to all, this connected two to all graph is something that could be uh, talked about from the language of quantum tasks. So we were actually able to prove that if you have some kind of n input n output causal structure for which this two to all graph is connected, then any task can be completed by a set of agents who have no pre-shared entanglement. I'll sketch for you how that works. This thing on the left represents a set of causal connections between three inputs and three outputs. And what I've sketched here is a scenario where agents one and two can meet up and agents two and three can meet up, but one and three can never meet up. So this is a situation where this two to all graph is connected because there would be an edge from one to two. Now, if these agents are given some task that they're asked to do, one way for them to do it is for agent two to prepare a bunch of EPR pairs and then send those EPR pairs, you know, halves of those EPR pairs to distribute some entanglement across the intermediary. When they do that, you end up with a diagram that looks like this, where all of your systems are now located on these two intermediary regions, so that those intermediary regions share some large amount of entanglement, okay? And that is exactly the kind of scenario that I indicated before due to this Beggy, Koenig, and Dolev result, where you can consume the entanglement to do an arbitrary task. So this is, you know, this is something that I might not have expected would be true if we hadn't known that it ought to be true from the tools in ADS and AP. And the general case where I talk about an arbitrary N and an arbitrary connected graph uses very much the same protocol where some of the agents distribute. Then we might ask if there is an analogy to the Tom Michel et al. kind of task where we can talk about a, an end-to-end -end task that has some necessary entanglement for completion that we could use to make some argument for that boundary entanglement structure. And we were able to construct such a task. It's a task on m qubits. It's implementable on any two to all, uh, any connected two to all graph with an order one depth circuit. And now we also need to say creation of only order m auxiliary qubits. The auxiliary qubits being like these ones that are used for create some intermediary entanglement. So there exists some task with all of these properties such that we can prove that it's non-local implementation with an n party resource requires Oh, sorry. Hmm. Requires large mutual information across any bipartition of the input systems. And if we make the same kinds of assumptions that we made in the two to two case, then this theorem could be used to argue for the end to end connected wedge theorem without making reference to gravity using purely this statement about quantum information theory that we construct. So you know, the, the lesson to take away from all of this, I think, is that as I indicated before, we see causal structure emerging from entanglement in some kind of binary way. And we also see that this can feed back to new ways of thinking about information processing in space time that don't make reference to ADS and AT and that can be considered as interesting. Thank you very much. I'll happy to take questions. Nico? Uh, no, it does not. There are counterexamples to the converse. Causality, it's more like entanglement emerges from causality, maybe? No, 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 no. It's the other way around, because if I have a certain causal structure, then I know I need to have entanglement, right? So uh, you could say these words any way you want, but the point is that 
there are certain kinds of causal structures that I can say must be emergent from entanglement. But, but it's not saying that any kind of entanglement is going to give you emergent causal structures. Okay, thanks. So I could imagine a situation where you have a non-empty scattering region, where, but where no scattering process can possibly preserve angular, sorry, momentum. Um, is, does that ever play a role in your um, results? Whether you're sorry, sorry, can you ask me a question? Yeah. So I can imagine a situation where the scattering region is not empty, but where no scattering process can conserve momentum. Is that very important? The scattering region is non-empty, but no scattering processes can preserve momentum. Oh, um, I would agree. Really... We don't, we aren't really thinking about scattering in the sense of like an S matrix where you send in some particles of definite momentum and then they push back in a certain way. I'm thinking about using the existence of a scattering region for me to send some agents in there who are carrying quantum computers and actors. So I don't need to think quite literally about scattering processes for Why are you restricting yourself to order one depth circuits? In yeah, because we imagine that we have some. Um... You know, the, the region of space time that these people are able to act in, this scattering region that I've been talking about, is something of finite extent. So imagine that the task I was asking them to do required them to implement a number of gates that went like e to the size of the input system. I may have to worry about whether or not they would be able to actually do that task in the limited time available to them to meet up. So being able to restrict ourselves to a finite depth circuit lets us not have to worry about that kind of potential issue. Yeah. I mean, so they could, could they not just implement the, like a, a complicated unitary by doing like a, a teleportation based implementation of the unitary. That's method. right, but they would need to have some pre shared entanglement. And in the bulk side of the duality, they have no pre shared entanglement, but they have a causal meeting point. Whereas in the boundary side of the duality, they have no causal meeting point, but they do have pre shared entanglement. Why don't you want to let, I mean, couldn't I let them have some linear amount of entanglement? Uh, in the bulk theory? Boundary. I mean, if it, if in the bulk theory, we give them access at the at the center of interaction to some entanglement. So I think you could easily imagine generalizing this in any number of ways that you want, right? You could imagine modifying the situation so you add some entanglement on one side, and maybe that gives you a weaker constraint on the other side or something. But the point here is that we are able to prove something. You know, we're able to, to prove a theorem by putting in these assumptions about having no pre-shared entanglement in the bulk. If I wanted to modify the situation, it might be harder for me to prove something. When you say prove a theorem, do you mean that if, if the ADS CP conjecture is true, then this theorem would hold? Uh, sorry. This is not proven in quantum No, these, these two statements are. These two statements are proven purely in quantum information without any reference to graphics. Right? Uh, the connected wedge theorem is proven using the, the consistency of the ADS CFT dictionary. Um, when you're consuming, you're using this to consume entanglement, or I assume we're allowed to use um, non unitary operations as well. You can do unitary or like projective measurements or something. Um, In non unitary, does that distinction matter? Well, imagine that you, you let yourself do some projective measurements. Right, then you're going to end up with some probabilistic outcome, right? But you could build that into the task. Like the task could be you want to succeed at doing a certain channel with probability greater than 0.75, right? Personally, I'd rather just think of the projective measurement as some you know, measurement channel that puts me into some classical superposition over the outcomes and talk about it that way. But you could frame this in a purely experimental language if you want, so long as you let yourself have some tolerance for the Is this shared entanglement, like between M1 and M2, uh, purely r tight, or do you need like GHZ type entanglement? So in this scenario, well, what I do, the protocol that we do here involves only by tight entanglement. We just distribute a bunch of EPR pairs between various regions. You know, there might be ways of doing it where you would distribute some there might be ways of doing it where you would distribute some kind of multipartite entanglement, but for the purposes of understanding the theorem, we didn't think that we needed to think that. Way. 
your pipe entanglement is actually enough to implement any one channel. Then? That's right. Okay, that's, so that's interesting. Yeah. I was wondering uh, changes when you move away from three-dimensional ADS. Uh, like, do you expect the results to hold and you just haven't proven it, or do you think it just wouldn't even hold? I'm going back and forth about this. Yeah, Alex is shrugging. Um, I don't think it's true above three dimensions, but I think something is true. Uh, there are a couple of problems. The main one is that when I sketched this picture for you, it was sort of important that in a three-dimensional space-time, um, any quantum extremal surface a quantum extremal surface for n regions sort of, sort of splits up into n distinct curves. And it was important for me to be able to treat those curves separately. That breaks down in higher dimensions. So there's an issue with the geometric proof technique. From the perspective of the information theoretic technique, I think that this assumption uh, about the only useful CFT resource being restricted to some region, I think that that's more questionable in higher dimensions for reasons that are a little more wishy-washy and harder to get into. Um, but as a result, I don't know if we should expect this to be true in higher dimensions. And if someone very enterprising wants to try to find a numerical counterexample in higher dimensions, I would love to see it. Uh, could you elaborate why mission information here is a good indicator of entanglement? It's equivalent to... Entanglement in your case. Oh, so it's not necessarily, right? I mean, so what Jinjiao is, uh, is pointing out is that uh, mutual information of a state does not necessarily reflect entanglement. It can also reflect classical correlations. But that doesn't really matter from our perspective, because in the gravity theory, what we prove is that the entanglement wedge is connected, or we prove that the mutual information is large. And you know, if you'd like, you can view the theorem as proving something about mutual information and remain completely agnostic as to whether that's a statement about entanglement or classical correlation. That would be a totally legal way to think about all of this work. Of course, there are all of these ideas that in ADS CFT, quantum correlations dominate, dominate over classical ones. This follows, or there are ways of thinking about this that follow from all of this entropy cone work. Um, but, you know, I'd be totally happy. Personally, I actually don't think about this as a mutual information statement. I think about it as the geometric statement of the connected entanglement wedge like this, and the mutual information correlations is just a half. From the uh, field theory point of view that one can utilize entanglement as a resource to overcome of causal restrictions. Mm -hmm. Now in the sort of spirit of uh, groping quantum gravity in the bulk, naively, if you allow yourself also sort of entanglement in the bulk, mm -hmm. um, you might expect to additionally uh, bypass the bulk causal restrictions. And I was wondering what that would translate back in the... Yeah. My answer is I don't know. Um, I think it's an interesting question. One comment I'll make is that if we talk about like entanglement in the bulk field theory, like graviton entanglement, for example, then generally speaking, the amount of graviton entanglement does not scale like one over G Newton, right? It's something that is just sort of fixed in that limit. So all of these arguments involve consuming an amount of entanglement that goes like one over G Newton. So you wouldn't expect graviton entanglement to tell you very much there. So in order to uh, say something about quantum gravity using that kind of reasoning, you would need to consider a scenario where you had a one over G Newton amount of bulk entanglement. For example, like islands, evaporating black holes, that kind of thing could definitely become relevant. Yeah. Can you say anything about the situation, and apologies if you mentioned this already, about the situation when the graph gamma is saturated? Where the graph? The gamma, the graph gamma when it's saturated, in other words. When everything is connected to everything? Yeah, no. I, this is really interesting, right? Like, it turns out that we can say something, it's sort of amazing that we can say something when the graph is just connected, but anything stronger than that doesn't teach you anything new. Now, from the quantum information perspective, that's not so surprising because we showed in quantum information that this connected graph is sufficient to do any of these tasks. So I wouldn't really expect for more structure to let me do something stronger. There might be something sort of subtle that I could say. There might be some, uh, you know, deeper statement about entanglement than just having large mutual information that I might expect to be able to conclude. Um, but, uh, 
I don't know what it is, and I'm not sure that it would really be anything I would expect to be able to say in a closed form.